Hello out there, everybody. Today I'm here with Oski from Improx Games, and he's just released an amazingly interesting new game that I think you're going to love watching and checking out and kind of learning more about. It's built in Unity, and when I first saw it, I was blown away by the visuals and the look and feel. And then I actually played the game, and now I'm kind of hooked. So I'm really excited to talk to you about this game, The Last Cube, talk to you about the process, how you guys came to build it, and how you actually put this whole thing together. I've got a couple of really specific questions that I want to ask about things that you've implemented in there that I'm curious how you did. But I just also want to have a general conversation with you about the game. So hello, Oski. Thanks for joining us. And um, thanks for being on here, answering questions and building a cool game. Hello. Uh, thanks for having me. So I guess I just want to start with a real quick question of, how long have you been building games? Well, I've been programming since I got into uni in 2014. Since I was around 18, I'm 26 now. And uh, we've been working with this group of friends with Improx Games, our whole company here, for the past six or seven years. And this is our second released game. We've been doing game jams and little projects here and there. But um, like uh, the, this la latest game, The Last Tube, we worked on for the past five years, just in our free time. And um, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah we've, been, we've been learning as we go. Yeah, that's um, kind of really impressive. I, I was expecting something else. I didn't expect that you'd been um, that new and had released something that cool with a group of friends, you said, just in your spare time. So you guys are working as programmers and developers doing other things and then building this game with your with your company that you've built um, in, in the spare time just as an extra thing, huh? It's, it's been very successful for it, from what I can tell at least. Yeah, it's, it really has been pretty, pretty good uh, so far. And uh, yeah, we've been, we are a group of six guys from Finland and uh, most of us, well, we know each other from different routes, but the group kind of uh, goes all the way back to our school time. And uh, wow, so you guys all met during school and then, or during that time and then got together, decided to start building games and have built two now. Can you tell us real quick, just a little bit about the first game? I didn't realize there was a first game. I'm gonna have to try that out too. Yeah, we kind of ramped up to it. Our first the game on um, Steam is called Trimmer Tycoon. It's a, it's a beard trimming game. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's a game where these pixel art customers flow into your shop and you have to uh, like take them to your barber's chair and trim their beards, their uh, desires, and uh, you get paid for it. And that's that's kind of the core loop there. Well, that is a, a, a perfectly on point uh, game for me too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I need a beard trim all the time. So that's, I'm going to try that thing out. That That is really cool. So you guys built that first and then decided when you're done with that, you wanted to put together something even bigger and, and build this last cube game, or did you know what you were going to build next? How did that process come about? Um, I'm not exactly sure how uh, how we kind of moved from Prima Tycoon to the last cube. To, like they, it, we slowly ramp it up. We start, we did like ten game jams together. Then one of the game jams was Prima Tycoon, the first version. That did well enough in the game jam. We we finished top fifty in in Ludum Dare, well one of them, and uh, that made us decide to keep working on the game and put it on Steam Greenlight. We got through, and uh, so we released it for free on Steam. It's still on. It's still free on Steam. But by the way, if uh, any viewers want to check it out, yeah, everybody um, should go grab it if you, if you haven't already. I I didn't know it was free. I was gonna go buy it, but now I'm gonna go grab it. <laughs> Well, that's the DLC if you want to support this. Uh, but yeah, as, as a free game, it that did well, really well in our like uh, scope. It got over a hundred thousand downloads thus far. It got it went kind of viral on YouTube, and um, it's a really cool theme. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's it's kind of a funny, yes, yeah, a humorous game. So that's gonna that helps with the virality. But yeah, something happened there. We did a couple more game jams, and then. Um, one of one of the friends in the company, Max, made this little prototype of a cube rolling around in, in the Blender game engine. Actually, we hadn't 
well, we had we had used uh, Unity for um, Trimmer Tycoon, but we like weren't really expert with it. Max was still more uh, familiar with the Blender game engine, so he made the prototype in Blender. Um, after, well, we 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 liked the prototype. We played it a bit, but uh, noticed that Blender wasn't good enough for that uh, to keep working on the game. So we ported it into Unity. Well, basically started over in Unity. And uh, from there on, we worked like all, well, most evenings or most summers just working on the game. Uh, just turning stuff out, huh? In Unity. So, what version of Unity was this then? It would have been, if it was five years ago, a relatively 2017 ish, or were you on the old five point whatever versions? Do you remember? Yeah, I think we started on 5.4, then we ended up with 2019.4. 34 it was the was the final version we released the game with but uh, we got all the all the cool releases like nested prefabs and stuff like that along the way and had to incorporate them into, into our workflow we went through like the whole cycle of giant unity updates i think 5.4 yeah. to 5.6 was like a huge one and then they started going to the year numbers and yeah quite quite a few updates there that must have been an interesting process did you guys run into issues doing the updates like why you were because you were working on the project for so long or did you kind of have an easy time with that i know some people run into big problems sometimes people don't even know that you can run into problems yeah um i think most of the time we were like there there weren't too many problems we tried to stick to the lts releases um that's a good safe way to do it <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to avoid the problems. Most of the time, the problems come when people want to use the brand new thing that just got out of beta or just got into beta, uh, and then yeah. something else random breaks. Yeah, I can't think of any like breaking changes that we run in, run into or had to revert Unity versions, for example. But uh, like the two major steps in the way were the nested prefabs and the addressables. Those were two huge stepping stones for us to like change the whole, how the game works to try to incorporate those. Oh, that's interesting. I was just gonna ask you if there was anything big that came in those updates that made a difference. So nested prefabs and addressables both. Um, addressables, I think I can kind of pretty easily understand. Most people probably know that, you know, you can save memory loading and unloading things and you've got quite a few levels, I assume you're using that mostly to manage assets. Is there anything else with the addressables that you're doing though? Um, well, nothing too fancy. We, like, as, as I said, we, we incorporated, incorporated it as, a, as kind of an afterthought. We had to uh, put in some kind of asset bundle system to be able to release patches on the Nintendo Switch since they have, they have a patch size limit of, I don't know if it's a public, it's a public number, but you, your patches need to be below a certain size. Yeah. So I think most of the platforms are like that. But if anybody watching, you've got limits on on those download sizes, at least from yeah. my experience. Yeah, but what, what, for the Switch, they are much smaller than for the others, uh, as far as I know. At least hopefully the others don't have anything that we have missed. Um, no, your Switch is probably the lowest, yeah. Yeah, so, so we ended up having to well, we, we had to use addressables or some asset bundle system. And since addressables was the new new kid in town, we ended up going with that. And um, yeah, we basically set up like very basic uh, groups for the addressables and then just load them uh, with the levels. But that's that's kind of enough, not enough to keep the patch sizes small enough. Oh, okay, so just use it for that download and then keep the patch tiny so that Nintendo's not doing a big update on, on their stuff. That makes sense. And I assume that was relatively easy to implement. Um, well, um, or was it somewhat like, difficult? Uh, like thinking back, it's with, with the, with the knowledge that we have now, it would have been easy to implement, but as we were, this was like three years ago, we were, we were not as good as at programming as we were back then and address was just brand new. So we had to learn as we went, and uh, we ended up making and remaking the addressable groups many, many times, trying to optimize and trying to figure out how this system works. But uh, 
finally we ended up with a with a setup that uh, works well enough. Nice. So it just took a bunch of iteration. Yeah. And then what about the nested prefabs? You'd mentioned that you switched to those. How did you? How did those come into play? Um, it's been it's been so long that it's kind of hard to remember. But uh, originally, uh, we had coded up some kind of a holder system for for game objects, trying to reuse data um, in the levels. And nested prefabs kind of made, made that obsolete. But uh, honestly, honestly, the current system we ended up with is a mixture of both. Um, it probably could just be done with nested prefabs, but uh, since we had the holder system, we ended up using that for some things. Oh, okay. That, that's something I've seen a lot of people do too before, especially before nested prefabs were around scripting something up that would kind of create and build up the thing out of the other prefab or prefabs under, underneath it and kind of be able to adjust that. Um, interesting, did you guys use prefab variants much when those came out? Was that something that you found useful? Uh, it's, it was an interesting uh, thing to like think about, but I don't think we have any of those in the game currently. I, I don't see them used very often either. I just always want to ask like, if somebody's got a a common a good use form other than like this custom version of a button which is what yeah. i usually see <laughs> yeah. I, I wish i had a good use for them but i we don't uh, it, it ends up rare because most of the time you end up writing code but I, think, yeah. I guess they could be handy for some things so uh let's talk a little bit about the game you know just tell everybody really briefly how the game plays with like the core mechanics of it yeah um the last cube is a Kind of an evolution on cube rolling games. Um, many many people remember block source from the mini clip or cool math games websites. And uh, well, basically you roll around as a cube in a grid, and stepping on different colors imprints that color onto the cube. And then you can use that same face of the cube to step on different things to activate buttons or activate lifts. And uh, in our game. Uh, you can also use this, use the different uh, colors to redirect laser beams, and uh, the the evolution we bring to the genre kind of is the sticker power. So each of these colors, the stickers we call them, has its own special power, which you can use when the when that color is on top of on top of the cube. Um, the six colors, the six different powers. For example, the blue power lets you rotate in place. Um, the yellow power lets you dash forwards for four squares, and all of these, and especially all of these combined, uh, like explode the uh, possibility space of the puzzles. Yeah, I realized that almost instantly. Once I figured out how to turn around, it's like, oh, this this changes things. Like you can, you can add a whole lot more to it. And then once I saw the dash, it's like, oh, this is really cool now because now i got to figure out how to get exactly in that spot at the right like the right thing up and yeah it was it's a lot of fun i and i can see how the level design is is influenced and really i guess driven by those powers it really focuses really well on showing you those and one of the things i loved about it was just the onboarding process it was so smooth and easy to get into without it didn't need like a bunch of pop-up text or things like to hardcore tutorial -y stuff and just, just playing the game and learning how very easily. It was really kind of a smooth process. Is that something you guys worked on a lot, just making that easy to get into, or was that just something that came automatic and natural for you? That was, that was, that was like definitely a conscious decision. We, we tried to get as far as we could without any text, partially because it's it was a good, like, uh, goal for the tutorial just to make it a make make the player learn instead of telling them how it works and um, or also to keep the localization costs down um, but uh, we had we had to add some some tutorial texts in the end but yeah um, as, as much as possible we try to introduce elements of the game slowly and then let the player exper experiment with these elements and uh, once in a while we we try to bring the elements back to remind the player of them 
uh, for example, before a big difficult puzzle, which we might add a little tiny mini, mini puzzle that reminds the player that hey, sometimes you need to dash forwards. Remember that because in the next puzzle you're gonna need. Sometimes you need to rotate and spin on the other side so you don't lose your yeah. sticker. Yeah, <laughs> it was definitely well done. So I, I like that a lot. Uh, one of the other things that I liked in there was the cinematics. So in the game, you do some really good transitioning from you're rolling around in this nice, very pretty, and I'm gonna talk to you about the rendering stuff later, a very pretty world with this cube. And then, you know, you beat apart and suddenly you're going through these nice cinematics, these things that I wouldn't normally expect in a, in a game like that. And I'm playing on an ultra wide and they look even better on here like oh yeah this is really cool it supported it looked good so um how did you guys do the cinematic process how do you go from your gameplay into these cool scenes where you're kind of flying around and showing what's going on in the level and, and introducing the next part of the, the cubes adventure uh, well they are implemented using cinemachine for the most part and um in cinemachine you can set up these um signals in the timeline and so we use some of those to trigger uh different things in, in code uh, most of those probably could be done with custom tracks but we just found it easier to add signals instead and um, the way we designed those was that uh, again max the person i mentioned earlier he would uh create like prototypes of these using premiere i think to just make a video of the of the cutscene and uh, we would all watch it and give it feedback and he would go and iterate it, iterate on it and then once he was happy with it he would go into Unity, set up the set up the scene, set up the uh, sequence in the machine and then that was it. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah, so you did so, a lot of iterating in video in in Premiere? Yeah. Well, Still I, I don't think. have. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> interesting. And then once it's decided actually build it out with Cinema Machine and, and timeline, huh? Yeah, I think I guess Premiere is just what well, he's most comfortable with. And, uh, yeah, artistic people are better with other tools than I am. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. that's very and, cool. Uh, the way the way they work in the game is that we just uh, fade to black, load another scene, fade back in back into the game, and um, the scene plays the cut scene, and then we fade to black, fade back to the next level. Oh, okay. So just load out, go into that cinematic scene, and then load back in. I, I noticed the fades too, they're nice and smooth. What do you do for the, the fades, by the way? I want to ask that and kind of dive in a little bit about the rendering. I'm just curious what it is you use because it looks really nice. Uh, I think the fade is just just a canvas set with the maximum numbers. So it's always on, stop, always on top and it's just a tween going to black and then... Okay, just the fading straight over. And then are you using the built-in pipeline, the universal render pipeline or the HD render pipeline for this game? We're using the built-in pipeline. Oh, okay. It yeah. it looks great. I couldn't tell. It looks, it looks nice. I can't tell which pipeline they're using. That looks really, really, really pretty. So it looks like you guys did a good job with um, post-processing effects. And yeah, we've, we've got a lot of lot of questions like, is it is it made with Unreal? <laughs> which which is which is really surprising to me. It's, I think and I think money mo like most Unity games have this uh, specific Unity look to them, and uh, somehow subconsciously we we managed to uh, like go, get away from that with with the post processing and um, all the all the bloom and stuff. And the lighting, yeah, you've done yeah. a great job with the the lighting and the post processing. Now, was that something that was done by a programmer, a designer, or an artist. I'm just curious. Who set up the actual visuals, the lights, the post-processing volumes, or post-processing layer, I guess? Well, actually, we, all six of us, well, actually, five of the six of us are programmers by trade, and the sixth one is a composer. So we don't actually have an artist in the team, which wow, is okay. really surprising. Um, <laughs> that is. I guess that explains why cubes, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, we we all kind of had to learn art during the project. The reason we went with pixel art for the first game was that we had no idea how to make three D art, so we made two uh, D art for that game and then learned Blender and three D art for this game. Um, so all of us 
kind of became familiar with with how to build scenes and we had to learn lighting theory and how how the post processing stack works and uh, I think for the most part it was me setting me setting up the post processing and our level designer setting up the lighting and uh, well everyone doing a little bit of, a little bit of everything did you find that you guys started specializing in different things as the team kind of went along? You've been working together for a long time. And if you're all programmers, did some of you guys start to like lean more towards graphic stuff and others towards uh, some other subset or, or somebody that really is like, I want to maybe I want to be an artist and be more of a technical artist that does some code or, or is everybody kind of all jack of all trades still in really in, in that route? Yeah, everybody is still uh, programming, but uh, we definitely had uh, Mika, uh, our level designer. He kind of became the art guy in the team. He's necessarily not necessarily very enthusiastic about that, but uh, since we needed an art guy, he ended up being the art guy. <laughs> um, and uh, Max, uh, who did, he ended up doing most of the puzzles just because he's He's, he's interested in that kind of stuff. And he's- like, Puzzles he's are very good. good. Very good at, at least that. the ones that I've played so far are well done. So you got a um, good job on that. Yeah. Yeah. So all of us kind of ended up slightly specializing in different subjects, just trying to learn uh, these different areas of uh, game making uh, while also wearing many hats. Nice. So do you guys plan on releasing another game? Or are you going to add more to the last cube? Is there going to be another cube? Or... <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, have this, we have this huge document full of ideas for the sequel. And kind of anything while making the game, anything that we wanted to add, but they didn't fit the scope, we just say that's, that's for the sequel. Um, but uh, it really depends on how well the game ends up doing. Currently, it's doing OK. It could be doing better. Um, and um, yeah, well, we'll definitely keep making games, but uh, whether it's the last cube two or DLC for the last cube, kind of depends on. It, it requires uh, people to have bought into the game. Um, oh yeah, of course, definitely want to keep building on what's working or switch to the next thing if. Uh... If you decide it's not, and everybody that happens to be watching this, go grab the game, try it out, and play it. I, I promise you'll enjoy it. It's definitely worth it, and yeah, you, you should get it. Go try it out. Uh, uh, if you don't mind, you got a little bit more time. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about just technical stuff with the game, on kind of how you set it up, um, and kind of just get an idea of issues or problems or interesting things that kind of came up that you think people might be curious about as a, as a programmer that's trying to build a, a game like this because you've got a game with I don't know how many levels but I assume a large number of them yeah six times three is 18 story levels and uh, I think five bonus levels something okay, like so a in total. good number of pretty big and interesting levels that all look um I, I think pretty interesting, very different from what I can tell. I assume yeah. that once I get to the next colors, everything's going to change even more. So how do you manage the different levels and the whole game setup? One of the most common questions people ask me about is just scene setup for their games. Do you just have like a single scene and everything's a prefab for every level? Do you have a scene for each level, multiple scenes for each level that you load in all additively? How do you how do you go about that? What did you find worked well for you? And you're using addressable, so does that tie into this? It kind of does. Um, if anyone watching this is making a game like this, um, I haven't tried this, but I, what I would do in the future is split up each level into multiple scenes, um, perhaps by puzzle. So currently, currently our our levels are scenes, and. Uh, the whole level is in the scene and um, that means when it's loaded in uh, or packaged as an addressable in, as an asset it's well some of some of the some of the uh, models and materials end up being pulled into the scene which i think you could get around but we didn't have time to kind of mitigate that so 
some of our scene bundles end up being 100 megabytes or something too large for for the patch size. Um, so what I would would have done is to split up this split up the scene by bustle into four or five scenes and load up load them up additively. That would hopefully help with the batch size. Oh, okay. That that's an interesting thing I hadn't thought about. If you really have to shrink that down, that makes sense. I've also seen for anybody who's curious, the scenes split up um, based on their use. So some for like visual effects, based on like the visual effects artist is working on these things and going to be committing changes independently. Makes it easy for source control. Also makes it easy to make sure that changes from uh, one department don't interrupt. So like particle effects might be in one gameplay systems and stuff might be in another scene for that scene. And then you know, there'd be another one for geometry, one for navigation and for you know, buildings or NPCs. I've seen a variety of different split out scene setups like that. So not too uncommon. And then for the rest of the game, do you just, do you like, when you load into a new level, do you load everything from scratch or are you keeping around some core objects like the cube or is the cube like a different cube in every scene? Just, I think people, a lot of people try to build these things and they have no idea where to start. So I don't know where you guys ended up. Yeah, I think I think the cube is a different cube in every scene. Um, the way it's, it's set a prefab up, it's though, right? Yeah, it's, it's a prefab. Uh, everything, well, most things are prefabbing in our projects. Um, the way it works is that we have two uh, essential scenes. So we have essentials and then essentials UI um, that contain like manager objects and uh, the UI UI contains all the all the UI objects. And um, the reason we split that up by the way is for automated testing because we didn't want the UI to be in the tests uh, to messing up messing up things. Um, so the way the way it works is that those scenes are always loaded, and then the level gets unloaded when it's finished, and the new level gets additively loaded on top. Okay, that's a very clean and, and good pattern. So you just mentioned testing, so I, I have to ask: um, you are you guys doing some automated testing, running unit tests or integration tests, or what's the setup there? Yeah, our our game didn't start off as very testable. Uh, everything's very very coupled together, at least to start off with. And um, like a year or two ago, I ended up refactoring a lot of the code for like a month straight to make the game support multiple cubes at the same time. And that that kind of that allows us to make tests into prefabs, uh, where each test contains a cube or perhaps multiple cubes and load them in a grid so we can run run multiple tests at the same time and that's before that before that each each test was its own scene so we had to run them uh, one after another which took us like 20 minutes and after that after this change everything running at the same time or in a couple of batches we cut the test time to like five minutes uh, so currently we have uh, just under two, just under two hundred uh, play mode tests. Wow, that's fast. So, what kinds of things do you test there? What, give, can you give an example of something that is that you're testing that has been interesting or caught a bug? Yeah. Um, well, after after this uh, refactoring I mentioned, we kind of took up this uh, practice of always making a test when anything breaks if possible, then fixing it and then committing everything. So that's, if, if it breaks again, we'll notice. And um, well, we, ha we have tests, for example, for the cube's movement, like if the if the input of the cube says to move forward, will the, does the cube end up moving forward? And same for each direction. And then um, let's say for, for the blue power that lets you rotate, if the input says to rotate, does the, does the cube actually end up rotating? And uh, just basic stuff like that. And you're able to catch whenever any one of those things breaks again because of some other change, which you know, as your project gets bigger, everybody probably knows happens quite often. Change one thing and something else you weren't expecting broke. That's a yeah. test, 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 stop that or 
they don't necessarily stop it, but they let you know that it happened before you go commit the code and push it out and break it for everyone, right? Yeah, we actually had this in our um, CI pipeline, continuous integration pipeline. So whenever we would uh, push a comment into the repo, the pipeline would run and uh, it would spam our Slack with uh, our build is broken, uh, fix the build. <laughs> yeah, we gotta go fix it. And that's always, I think, a, a handy process, especially when you have a lot of people working on a project, committing things constantly. It's very easy to accidentally break something that somebody else wrote if you're not um, very aware of what's going on and aware of all of the things. And the, the tests let you be more aware of it. Yeah, and especially since, since there's so many interactions and uh, different ways the mechanics can can work together. It's very hard to manually test things and remember the things that broke before and go back and test if those haven't broken again. And um, another good thing about tests is that it, they make you make you think about how to be more consistent. That's one the most one of the most annoying things I find about tests is, is are tests that sometimes work and sometimes don't. That's that's horrible. <laughs> when, that's when not a good test. <laughs> when, when you end up in a situation like that, and uh, many times that's just, that's just our code kind of having race conditions. So, for example, the cube rolls onto a onto a tile. Does the cube check the tile first? Does the tile check the cube first? Like the different things can happen in those situations on different machines and at different times. Um, so you end up, you end up having to think about these things and like code with those things in mind that that makes your code better. Yeah, that's been my experience as well, that writing testable code means that you're generally writing better code. It's cleaner, yeah. it's more clear what it's doing and there aren't, you're less likely to code in side effects. Mm. It's, you can notice it as you're writing the code, you're, you're solving a very specific thing and you try to, at least in my experience, write much better code that way. Not the easiest thing to do in Unity specifically, but it's uh, definitely something that I, I think is worthwhile and obviously has helped you guys ship and release this game in your spare time, which still yeah. blows me away. <laughs> yeah, and if anyone's interested, there are talks on YouTube by, by Mojang, the makers of Minecraft, and uh, Sea of Thieves people on very similar systems to this and how they, how they handle testing. So I guess one of the last things I wanted to ask you is about any, just if there are any interesting technical issues or things that came up along the way, along the six years, any problems or just in things that you thought were kind of an interesting thing to solve or you know, figure out that you built in this game. Hmm. Let's see. Anything that you got stuck on or if not, it's fine. I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I have I have a couple in mind, but I don't know. I'm just trying to pick for the most interesting ones. <laughs> like, uh, well, the, the, the couple I have in mind is that if anyone out there is making a game for both PC and the Switch, or PC and any console pretty much, remember to test on the consoles too, especially on the Switch as well, because the Switch has a limited amount of memory. And something that runs on, on PC probably won't run on your first try on the Switch because it will run, run out of memory and it can be very hard to solve that after the fact. Um, the other thing was something that I still haven't figured out. Um, there was, there was a, uh, an issue where our, our post-processing profile, uh, the reference to it ended up being null in the build. Um, and it, it was a thing where the profile was set as a reference in editor, just in, in the script, in the components. And for some reason in the build, it ended up, ended up disappearing. And uh, I couldn't for the life of me figure out why that happened. So I just scripted a little hack uh, into the in this code component where it would fetch it from the, from the resources folder instead. And um, that's what we ended up with in the game. Well, that's an interesting one. I wonder what it could be. I don't know if anybody has an idea, drop a, a comment and let us know. Only thing I can think of is if it was like in an editor subfolder or something, so it's getting stripped out, but 
if you can find it afterwards, it's, that's not the case. <laughs> yeah, no. I don't know what it is. That's, that's curious. Okay, that's some interesting ones. I think your point on testing on the actual device is dead on. I've seen so many people work on like a super high-end dev system with ridiculous amounts of memory, multiple processors in it, and the best video card you can have and then release their game and wonder why nobody else can play it. Or they try to get it out onto a mobile device and suddenly they're having a panic attack because their game gets three frames a second or doesn't even load because they, they forgot that they wanted to test on the actual target. <laughs> you gotta yeah. test your game on the target. Prototyping doesn't matter, but once you're building your game, you gotta actually get it out there on the device regularly. Yeah, actually here's, I, I just remembered an interesting thing that we ended up doing for optimization's sake and that's actually improved the code base I, I, I'd say. So um, the coordinates of the cube world are saved in an array because we have to we have to keep track of um, which coordinate of the world is occupied by something. And that's since we don't use physics for that, we just save every coordinate in a 3D array. Um, and that kind of that that went over many iterations over the project's uh, lifetime. Originally, it was a, a thousand by a thousand by a thousand array of these coordinate, coordinate objects, which took up gigabytes of RAM. So we, we ended up having to refactor away from that. We tried to use a an oct tree, which is a three-dimensional tree structure that you can use for spatial um, well, spatial structuring, um, that is okay, but uh, finding finding uh, things like looking up if there's anything at a specific point, uh, it was still slow enough for us because you have to iterate through all the sub subjections of the oak tree. So what we ended up going with, uh, or the final solution ended up being that we refactored uh, the coordinates uh, class to be a struct, so uh, it's no longer allocated uh, in the heap, so it's now uh, allocated on the stack, so it's, it doesn't take up nearly as much uh, memory as it did. So, and that that gave us like 20 FPS, uh, a 20 FPS improvement. That wow, was, uh, that's not what I would have thought of. That's an, that's neat. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Oh, that's cool. And that worked fine on the Switch too, huh? Yeah. Wow, that's, that's, that's cool. You always run into weird problems as soon as you get out to like going out to devices. I, I, I know I keep saying the last question, but I have one more last question about your continuous integration pipeline and that process and deploying out to a device. So when you were building this thing out and going out to the Switch, how early in the process did you set up CI to just build to an actual switch device? Or were you able to do that as something you still have to manually do? That's still something we have to manually do. Our well our, our CI system is it's in one of our one of our one of our guys' basements uh, running on a server. So it's not the most reliable thing. Um, we we set it up like a couple of years ago and it's like uh, when it works, it's, it's great, <laughs> but uh, sometimes it's down, and then that's it's no longer like usable. So we currently it's not working anymore. Uh, we we did use it at one point uh, to make uh, builds for PC standalone, Steam, I think Xbox and PlayStation possibly as well, but the Switch we never ended up integrating into it. And, uh, yeah, I think currently we make all builds manually, but we, I think we still use it to run the um, tests on there. Oh, okay. Interesting. I I think it's funny you said it's under his desk, because it reminds me of when I, I first um, was working at Sony, and the build server was under my desk in my cube. I was just sitting there under my desk. I had like three computers there. One of them was the build server for our game and yeah, one day somebody, I think IT came by and just like took it. <laughs> like, uh, it's just, it's just, it's just, what, they thought it wasn't supposed to be there. 
walked off with it. Luckily, I, I was able to get back pretty quick and we got our builds up and running. And eventually, it gave us a spot in a, in a rack and got a, a real server so I could stop having the build server be something that was under my desk that I was like cannibalizing other computers to upgrade. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's, nice. That's funny. That and that was you know, a big AAA game, so, so uh, not not everything is always uh, as clean and automated <laughs> as it yeah. should be. Yeah. But that's uh, it's still um, I don't, I'm a little bit off track. But I guess I I just wanted to see if there's anything else you wanted to share about the game or about the process before we wrap things up. Anything that found interesting or just want to talk about the game a little bit and about how cool it is or anything else um, well I can I can share that um, while I did the refactoring to allow for multiple cubes to be in the same scene the idea behind that like 50% of the idea behind that was the testing but the 50% the other 50% was co-op, and uh, that's something that I really wanted to do, but uh, we never ended up having the time for it. But technically, if you just toggle a switch in the code, you can have two cubes uh, controlled by different people. Um, but that that's it's just the cubes that the audio doesn't react, and uh, well, most things don't work, but uh, it's, it's something that um, we had to cut. and. Uh, that's unfortunate. It, it, like the co-op mode in Portal 2 was such a fun, fun experience for, for, for us. So maybe that's something we can come back to in a DLC or a patch later. Yeah, I think that would definitely be interesting. Be yeah. cool if you had some puzzles that just require two cubes. It'd even be cool to have uh, two cubes on on one system, like a local co-op. So, yeah, that's, that, that's why it would be it would be a local. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be that would be interesting. A lot of yeah. fun. So, yeah, I, I I would definitely convince at least one other person to play it with me. <laughs> so, I think you should do it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I guess assuming that the game's a success, so everybody get out there, go buy the thing, leave a positive review. I'm gonna go drop a review after I uh, finish up a couple more levels, so I've got some more details to drop in there. But yes. I'm having a blast with it, and I think that everybody watching will. And if you're a Unity developer, go see kind of how this thing was put together. You know, go try it out and see how the game feels and how it flows. It's really polished and just well done. So it's a perfect example of the kind of games you can build. And the graphics, and like I said, you're using the built-in render pipeline, and it still looks amazing. You can't tell. It, it looks great. <laughs> it definitely looks impressive. So, I, I like it a lot. I, don't know, I'm, I could just keep babbling about how much I like it, but I'll shut up now. <laughs> I don't know, you got any final words, Asti? Is there anything else? Uh, yeah, actually, a lot, one more thing came to mind. That's right. Um, we, we noticed that the post-processing stack was really heavy. And uh, on the Switch, we th thought about just turning it off completely. So it's, it's like 20% of the performance. Uh, of the frame frame time uh, but it, it makes such a big difference that we ended up having to we ended up cutting from other places just to be able to keep it in and uh, stay about the 30 frames per second on the switch as well that is probably a good good decision because that post processing just makes the game really pop so yeah <laughs> yeah so that, that's cool you just went and found something else to cut out huh and optimize so do you have special optimizations then for the Switch and for the other consoles? Uh, yeah. Uh, nothing in the code that I can think of, but uh, we we set the uh, textures on the Switch to have a smaller max size, and um, the settings on the consoles are different, um, or, the, or the default settings at least. And uh, we made it so that on the Switch you cannot enable uh, any of the post-processing settings, so because those would be uh, those would be too heavy. Uh, besides the ones that we decided were worth it, like like bloom and uh, color correction, since those were kind of required for the look of the game. Right. 
Okay, oh, that's cool. So you didn't have to do any extra code. <laughs> yeah, uh, the the only platform specific code is the uh, like platform controllers that we have. So those are those are little little controller uh, scripts that handle like, achievements, the users, um, profile images, things like that. And that's got, that's just they are they are all housed in a manager that. Uh, using a compiler I, I don't know what it's called but the preprocessor directives yeah, pre there you go yeah. using that it instantiates the correct one and then it just calls the functions there nice so you've got it all kind of wrapped away and abstracted so you can switch between steam or xbox or whatever without having to do anything but change the build target that's definitely the way to go for anybody who's building out to multiple systems too you want to abstract that stuff away early and um, start building on top of the abstraction and make it work for the other systems. Um, yeah, and that, that's just the mine I'm really proud of because it's, it's, as you said, very abstract. So we can we can just pull it out of the game and put it into another game. It's, uh, we've managed to keep it abstract enough to reuse it later. Oh, nice. Maybe you should release that as an asset store pack someday. Someday. So they're selling it as an additional revenue stream for the company. Yeah, that, that would be cool. It's it's uh, it contains a lot of the platform's own code, so that might be difficult to license. But maybe you could like abstract it out enough, so that's not necessary even. Possible, yeah. It's a, a, an idea at least. It's probably a distraction from what you should really be doing, which is <laughs> adding in the co-op and, and more levels in, in the next game. So <laughs> yeah. I'd probably focus there, but still a neat idea. All right, Aski, uh, I just wanted to say thanks for joining me and letting me ask you a bunch of questions and, and sharing some insight. Um, to be honest, I hope we can do this again sometime if you're up sure. for it. I, I'd love to just pick your brain and, and ask you a bunch more questions sometime because this is a lot of fun and you seem to know a lot. So it's, it's very cool having a lot of, a lot of fun with it. So um, did you want to say anything final before we drop off and say goodbye to everybody? No. Other than good. go buy the game? Go yeah, get the go, last go cube, the go play it, and comment how far you get in the description in the comments below. Yeah, the last cube is out on Steam, the Switch, all of the Xboxes, and uh, PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. Uh, you can get it on all of those. Um, we also have a Discord community that you can uh, you can join. It's at discord.lastcubegame.com. Um, yeah. So I'll make sure to pop all those up and put them in the description as well. So you can go grab it on whatever platform you're using. I got it on Steam, but whatever you're using, go grab it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks again. And uh, thanks everybody who's here watching us. And yeah, I mean, like, subscribe, go grab the game. And we'll see you again soon.